our unit on the church, ecclesiology, we have looked at uh, the leadership in the church with Pastor Eternus, the primacy of Peter, the primacy of Rome, um, who is the Pope and what is his authority. That was with Pastor Eternus. Then we turned to uh, what are the images describing the mystery of the church. The church is bride, is mother, is body of Christ, and lastly is the sacrament of salvation. Today, we turn to look at a specific question which engages all of these notions. Is the church necessary for salvation? We call the, the course that we are doing here, the course is entitled Teachings of the Catholic Church. So everything we're looking at is what does the, the church teach and why? We want to examine Catholic teaching and we've done this, right? What's the relationship of faith and reason? What does the church teach about creation, evolution, Trinitarian theology, Christology, pneumatology, Mariology? We've done all of these ologies, branches of theology, and now we're in ecclesiology, looking at the church. But it's specifically, decisively from the Catholic teachings, okay? I'm emphasizing this now because we're, we're getting into an area in which there might be some sensitive topics. You are not going to be required to share the same beliefs as what the Catholic Church teaches. I'm not asking that, but I'm, I am asking that before you make your judgment about why does the church teach this, to first understand what does the church teach, okay, understand it clearly, and then why does it teach what it teaches, okay, and then whether or not you choose to, to agree or disagree, uh, that's fine either way, but let's get a handle on what does the church teach and why does it teach this. Now we're looking at the church in relationship to uh, the rest of the world, whether it be other Christians or other non-Christians, other religions. Is the church herself necessary for salvation? That's the question being asked. Okay, so we will proceed with um, that understanding in mind. And if we first look at scripture, we do find that clearly there is articulated in scripture the reality of salvation as offered to all. Okay, God's universal salvific will, his will for salvation is universal. He wants everyone to be saved. We have this clearly stated in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, where Paul says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay, so God wants everyone to be saved. Salvation is offered to all. Christianity is not an elitist religion. Uh, rather, God welcomes everyone into the sheepfold. However, this inclusivity is not an absolute inclusivity without any conditions, right? Because God wants all peoples to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It entails encountering the truth. It entails encountering Jesus Christ and this knowledge of truth, which transforms us, that we must act according to the truth that is revealed to us. So it's not simply, oh, um, everyone is saved. So you can do whatever you want. Just don't bother one another. Just be at peace, coexist, and we're, we're okay. That's not the idea. That's not going to be the teaching. The teaching will be that the church is necessary. And if that's the teaching, then the question that follows is, what happens to those who do not belong to the church? So it becomes a, a complex issue, though not one which the church evades. At the Second Vatican Council, the church faces the question head on and gives us a very clear, reasonable theological answer. Okay, but we need to follow that development and understand what the church actually teaches. So the question posed in the famous Latin phrase is extra ecclesium non salus est. Extra is like beyond or outside. Ecclesium, ecclesia is the Greek word for gathering or church, outside the church, non Salus, salus is like health. Um, there is no health or no salvation. Is, est, is, is. Um, there is no salvation outside the church. Now, this is also found in scripture. So if we look at the gospels, quoting Jesus, okay, Jesus says in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Okay, so how can one be saved? Where is salvation? Salvation resides in he who believes. Okay, you must believe. And salvation also entails that belief brings you to a concrete expression of your faith in being baptized. Or in Luke 13, 3, 
Jesus says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Baptism, salvation requires repentance, meaning rejecting your sinful ways, rejecting, renouncing all the evil that may have been a part of your life. And if you do not repent, you won't have salvation. You're going to perish. Or in John 6, Jesus says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. What is he saying? If you want eternal life, eternal happiness, i.e. salvation, ah, what must you do? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. This is the Eucharist, okay? So we're going to um, develop that much, much more in the coming weeks. It is clear that so, on the one hand, Jesus, God offers salvation to all persons, but there are conditions for salvation. It's not simply enough to say, I'm saved, and then go do evil deeds. No. To say, I'm saved means I believe in Jesus. I give my life to Jesus, and I live according to his teachings. I reject my sins. I profess faith in baptism, and I eat his flesh and drink his blood. Okay? So, yes, indeed, the church and baptism are necessary for salvation. When we speak of salvation, we are speaking of a Savior, and there is only one Savior. Jesus Christ alone. Okay? You cannot say there, there are other ways to salvation. Because if you do, then you don't need Jesus. Jesus is unnecessary. But to be Christian is to profess faith in Jesus as the one and only mediator of salvation. He, by t virtue of the incarnation, taking on human flesh and, and human soul, human nature, he gives us the access to God the Father. Okay, apart from him, there is an infinite abyss that exists between God and man, between creator and his creatures, between sinless eternal God and sinful man. Okay, so salvation is only mediated in the person of Jesus. You will not find salvation anywhere else. This idea, too, is found in scripture. We have Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he is the way. He's, he's the way where? To the truth. The truth of what? The, the truth of eternal life. And you cannot come to the Father. If you want the eternal Father, you can never get to the Father except through Jesus. Acts 14, the very early church, vibrant with the Spirit. Peter says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Salvation only happens in the name of Jesus. So again, we come to this diagram of the sacramental economy of the church. It's always Jesus who is at the center. He alone is our savior. But how does he save us today, 2,000 years after he actually existed on earth? Well, he continues to exist in his mystical body, the church. So it's not the church that saves. It's Jesus who saves, but he saves us today through the church. And the works of Jesus extend through these rivers of mercy, flowing water, of the sacraments. Sacraments are extensions of the work of Christ himself. The first and most important of the sacraments is baptism. Why? Because baptism opens the doors to all of the other sacraments. It opens the doors to life in Christ. We have said that sacraments always involve a matter and form, some very real uh, physical reality that points to a deeper invisible reality. What happens in baptism? So baptism uses water. That's the physical visible reality. And water cleanses. In baptism, what happens? We are cleansed of our original sin so that we can come alive in Christ. We are reborn in Christ. Up here, you have this chart that draws out the parallel uh, of what happens in baptism for us. It unites us to the Paschal mysteries of Christ. So Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In baptism, we must first repent of our sins. Okay? We die to our sins. In the same way Christ is buried, he's laid in the tomb, so too the person being baptized is submerged into water three times. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. That's uh, being submerged, being underwater, is symbolic of death. But one does not remain there. Rather, one emerges in the same way Christ emerges from in the resurrection and glory and new life. So too the soul who is 
conform to Christ in baptism also rises to new life. It is the Holy Spirit now who comes to dwell, to vivify. Remember the Lord, the giver of life, that's the spirit, right? He gives us life. Well, here in baptism, he gives us, he is the beginning of this new life. So baptism bears forth uh, great effect. It's the most important of all the sacraments. And it has uh, these five main effects that I have listed here. The first of the effects is the forgiveness of sins. Now remember, sin is that disruptor of communion. It alienates us from God and from our neighbor and disintegrates us within ourselves. Everyone is, who is human, is born into the human race, is born with original sin, conceived in original sin, except Mary, who was preserved, but redeemed nonetheless, right? What happens at baptism? That original sin is erased, is forgiven. God's forgiveness, he heals the wounds of our soul. That disintegration within ourselves and the disunity and loss of communion with God, baptism is that reconciliation with the Father. It, it heals the brokenness and forgives us of our original sin. And if the person being baptized is at the age of reason and has most likely incurred, committed other sins, personal sins, um, then the, all of those sins too are wiped away so that the newly baptized person is a brand new being um, because all of their sins have been forgiven. Now, I did say um, the person at the age of reason or an adult that's baptized has their personal sins forgiven. Clearly, a child or a baby who has not reached the age of reason cannot freely, knowingly, and willingly, with his intellect and will, free will, commit a sin, right? Because they, they're not at that rational capacity yet. But once you hit the age of reason, let's say that's typically defined as around age seven, um, children by that age know, can distinguish between right and wrong. And they certainly know it when they've done something wrong. Right? There's this guilt that plagues them, they cry, they feel like they've been bad. Uh, that's a clear sign of there is this real cognizance of personal sin. So once personal sin is committed, there is offense here and it is forgiven in baptism. So baptism wipes all of that away. With that, in baptism, that's, this is the beginnings of redemption. Um, and in baptism, the rite of baptism contains a rite of exorcism. And here, yes, we are referring to exercising demons, exercising Satan. Um, so in the rite of baptism, there is a profession of faith in God, the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ's Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, and a, a rejection of Satan in all the evil ways of, of the devil. That rejection is a real casting out, a, an exorcism. You're, we are exorcising the, the devil by the power of God in our faith. That says that, yes, indeed, by your free will, you can use your willpower to cast out the spirit of evil in your life, meaning you're not choosing to follow it. You're willfully rejecting it and choosing Christ. This is what fundamentally happens at baptism. And if that evil spirit continues to plague you, you can here and now say, I cast you out. To the feet of Jesus, you go. Leave me alone, right? Um, exorcism is real. Okay? It happens in, in very real ways today, but and it happens in a, in a very fundamental way in baptism. So that we reject Satan and we no longer belong to the powers of evil, but now we belong to Christ. With that, we become number three, third effect. We become a new creation. Something new is born in us. We are born to new life. That life is signified by these four things. Firstly, sanctifying grace. It's the, the grace, the gift of God that sanctifies, that makes me holy. The spirit comes to dwell within me and bears his gifts that make me holy, make me like God. And with these gifts come the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. Now, these are called theological because they are in relationship to God, theos, okay, theological. They're, they are oriented to God. So it's not about having faith that it's going to be a good day today. No, it's, it's having faith in God. It's placing all of your hope in God. It is the ability to love God, right? So it's theological. And they're called virtues because they are true powers that have been activated in your soul. 
Okay, so remember your soul has faculties, right? You have an intellect and a will. Prior to uh, a, a supernatural existence through baptism, the powers of your soul can work. So I have, let's say I'm not yet baptized, I have an intellect and a will, and I can use my intellect to say, aha, I've got some good chocolate here. And I can use my free will to tear it open, take a bite, and enjoy, savior, the sweetness and the richness of good chocolate, right? Um, and I can really, truly enjoy it. So these are the powers of my soul to freely choose to act in a certain way. But in, in baptism, what happens? The powers of my soul, my intellect and, and will are now activated on a supernatural level. It's no longer simply knowing chocolate, but now it's knowing God. It's relating to God in faith. I truly come into relationship with him in faith and in hope. I place my hope not simply in good chocolate, but I place my hope in God because sanctifying grace has activated the powers of my soul so that I can utilize these powers in this way. And now I, who was previously a stranger to God, I can now love him because I know him and I have a relationship with him. Okay? So there are real powers in your soul. And just because you don't see your soul doesn't mean it's not there. It's truly there. It's if you're alive, you, you, you are animated by your soul. Now, when I speak of powers, think of like your eyeball, right? So your eyes, a, a real bodily organ, which has a power, it's the power of sight. So your eyes give you the power of sight, your soul, your intellect, and your will have these powers of knowing and willing on a very natural level, freely choose to, to act. But I can also act on a supernatural level now through baptism. The fifth effect is that baptism is gives an indelible seal. It stamps the soul, okay, forever as marked as a child of God. And this can never be erased. So if it is a valid baptism, it doesn't matter in what church that this happened in, but if it is professing truly faith in Jesus Christ in a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in whose name we baptize, then it's the same baptism. If there is truly an indelible seal, it can never be erased. It can never be lost. Let's say I've been baptized Christian Catholic, and let's say I, I stray from my Christian Catholic faith, and let's say I, I reject Christianity altogether. The indelible mark is not erased. God still has a claim over me because there's a fundamental ontological change that has already taken place through the initial baptism. Now, I can mar that. I can try to erase it, but it's like once that seal has been given, I'm still a child of God, no matter how much I deny it, right? So you can deny, you can denounce your parents and reject them and say, I have nothing to do with you. You can change your name. Um, you can move to a far off land and, and never contact your actual parents, but they are your parents and you can never change that. In the same way, when God gives us rebirth and baptism, that indelible seal is even more infinitely indelible. It's from God. This is why a person is only baptized once. Now, let's say after straying, decades later, I decide I repent and I return uh, to my Christian faith. Should I be rebaptized? No. Okay, it's a testimony to the indelible seal or the indelible mark. Uh, it endures. The baptism is valid and it, it remains there. Okay, it's effective. I do not need to be rebaptized. Nor do those persons who have membership in, or are baptized in other churches or congregations who want to enter into the communion of the Catholic Church, nor must they be rebaptized, because the church recognizes it's the same baptism, okay? and it produces these effects. Four, effect number four is theosis, and this flows from number three. Uh, in three, we are born again, we're made a new creation, the powers of our soul are activated so that we can now relate to God in a supernatural way, and it means that truly uh, we become children of God. And as children of God, we are heirs to the kingdom of heaven, to eternal life. But it's not simply empty words saying, oh, I'm a child of God. And then I go and do evil things. No, if indeed we are living out this reality of being born anew, this reality of grace and the theological virtues, then what you have here is divinization or theosis. Theosis is the Greek word. When you have asian or cis at the end as a suffix, we're referring to a process, okay? What's this process about? It's the process of being divinized or the process of being made like Theo, God. We're not talking about making idols of ourselves, 
but we are talking about this process of being conformed to God, sharing in the divine nature of God. It's different than what Eve chose when she heard the snake say to her, the serpent said, eat this fruit and you will be like God. That was Eve choosing to be like God against God's will, not obeying God in order to be like God. Here in baptism, what happens? God is inviting us. He wants to share his nature with us. He wants to make us like him. He wants us to enter into fellowship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So this is a being made like God, divinization or theosis, according to God's will. And this is what God wants for us in his universal salvific will. So baptism is that essential doorway, threshold into a life of grace. It opens the doors to all of the graces of all the other sacraments. That brings us back to the question of, is the church necessary for salvation? We've already uh, seen that you can still have baptism outside of the church, but baptism is, is of the essence uh, because it conforms us to Christ. It is rebirth in Jesus Christ. Is the church herself necessary for salvation? Now, we've looked at the scriptural testimony, what happens after the time of the Bible, the extra biblical testimony. We have, we enter into the patristic era, the time of the early church fathers. And there is also a discussion about, is the church necessary for salvation? Extra ecclesium non salus est, is the church necessary for salvation? A famous um, quotation from Cyprian, extra ecclesium non salus est comes from Cyprian himself. But Cyprian also says, you cannot have God for a father if you have not the church for your mother. If you want salvation in the name of Jesus, who is the son of God, then you must have the church for your mother. The church is necessary. Origen will say something similar to Cyprian in the first quotation. Origen will say, extra ecclesium nemo salvatus. What does this mean? Extra ecclesium, we've already seen outside the church, nemo. Does anyone know what Nemo means? It is a Latin word, but it's made in its way into popular culture. Looking for Nemo, finding Nemo. Um, Nemo actually is the word for no one okay, or nobody. Okay, So outside the church, Nemo, nobody, salvatus, nobody is saved. It's the origin echoes uh, what Cyprian has already taught, uh, that outside the church, no one is saved. Or St. Jerome, who translated the Bible into Latin, Whoever is not in Noah's Ark will perish. So remember the great flood, there is Noah's Ark, and those who heeded God's word to Noah entered the Ark and they were saved. The rest of the world perished in their sin. Okay, God al allowed the flood because the world was so overwhelmed with, with sin and sinful behavior. The Ark of Noah is a symbol for the church. Enter the church in order to be saved in order that you may not perish from this great flood of sin. Now, who were these church fathers, Cyprian, Origen, Jerome speaking to? Were they speaking to Christians or non-Christians? What do you think? You, you would think they were speaking to non-Christians, right? Because this is how these statements are used today. But actually, if you go back to the original context, they weren't speaking to non-Christians. They were actually speaking to Christians. So it's taking their quote out of context to use these quotes and condemn everyone who is outside the church. You're outside the church, you're going to be damned. That's not the original meaning. The context in which these statements were made were to the early Christians who were being persecuted. And there was a risk of them rejecting their faith out of fear of losing their life, out of fear of torture the church fathers were exhorting the early Christians who were facing persecution to remain steadfast, put firm to your faith because this is where you will have salvation. Do not reject your faith. So we need to understand these statements properly in the proper historical context. They were not spoke, these words were not spoken to non-Christians as a words of condemnation, but rather they were spoken to Christians as words of exhortation to remain faithful. Okay. It's not until we move forward in time, so we're, we're tracing this development, we move forward in time and we enter into the medieval world that we see that kind of extreme condemnatory um, tone because the Western world in the Middle Ages has become entirely Christian. It, it's a kingdom that is Christian, medieval Christendom. 
So you have this clear teaching now by the time of the fourth Lateran Council in 1215, which will say that there is but one universal church of the faithful outside of which no one at all is saved. Okay. This now bears that connotation that everyone outside is condemned. But it, it's not the original that you find in the church fathers. This um, strict mentality of uh, exclusive mentality uh, going to find its peak expression in Pope Boniface VIII, who issues this bull entitled Unum, Unum Santum in 1302. And there he says, we declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So that's really narrowing the road of salvation, the numbers of the saved, only those who are subject to me, he says, right? So that's extreme exertion of his papal power, okay? but it's not the original teaching. So we see the church and its, its understanding of salvation developing through time, and it's conditioned by the circumstances of the day. Moving further uh, um, into the next centuries, we see new developments in which new questions emerge. By the 15th century, we have, we have the discovery of the new world. So what you have here, suddenly Christianity, Christendom discovers there's this whole other world this new found land in which there are inhabitants and the entire population has not heard the message of the gospel. They are not a part of the church yet. Are they damned? Now, it wouldn't be in keeping uh, with the gracious, forgiving, merciful God to damn these people who, by no fault of their own, do not yet belong to the church, right? It's not their fault. No one's ever evangelized them. They've, they've not heard the name of Jesus. And so the question emerged, are these people actually going to be condemned? And um, the answer to this was the opening of a new kind of understanding, a distinction of the possibility of non-culpable ignorance of the gospel. We're looking here at ignorance of the gospel, not knowing the gospel, not knowing the good message, the name of Jesus and salvation in his name. But we can distinguish there's a possibility of non-culpable ignorance, ignorance in which your culpability refers to your guilt ignorance in which you are not guilty. The distinction here is between vincible ignorance and invincible ignorance. Okay, so ignorance refers to you, you are not knowing. Now, are you guilty? Are you culpable? Well, it depends on whether or not this ignorance is overcomable, vincible, or invincible. Are you responsible for knowing? Should you have known? Is this ignorance that you should have overcome? So if I'm driving down the street and a cop car chases after me and um, I stop and go down my window and the cop says, do you know what you were doing? And I say, I have no idea. I mean, what did I do wrong? And he says, you ran a red light and I claim ignorance. I didn't even see the red light. It's not my fault. How can I be guilty if I didn't see it? The cop will write me a ticket nonetheless. Because I, if I put myself behind the wheel, I have the responsibility of paying attention to the traffic lights. I, I can claim ignorance, but it is a vincible ignorance. I should have overcome it. I, I am still responsible. Hence, it is a culpable ignorance on my part. But with the, the natives of the Newfoundland, they are ignorant of the gospel indeed. They didn't have not heard of Jesus, but theirs is an invincible they're not responsible. The result of this is we're going to have a missionary impulse. Therefore, we must indeed take Jesus's great commissioning seriously, go to the ends of the earth and preach the good news. This is serious. Um, but also at the same time, it gives this new perspective, new view of the, the possibility of an of the gospel um, in which people are not responsible. When I used to teach high school and I would come to this point of doctrine and the distinction between the vincible and invincible ignorance, um, the students would say to me, oh, sister, why'd you have to tell us? Now that we know, we have to, we have to live according to what we know. And I say, well, indeed, of course. How can you sh choose the darkness, blind ignorance, to the light of truth? You simply cannot uh, claim the easier way as it's better not to know than to actually know and to, to actually live according to the truth and a virtue and goodness. You can't do that. 
And if you had the opportunity and you simply shut your ears and close your eyes and you turn your face from knowing the truth or you just fall asleep in class, you're still responsible. Okay, that is still invincible ignorance and you are still culpable. Okay, uh, the circumstances of the modern world with the discovery of the new world um, gave rise to a uh, more differentiated understanding. And the same thing goes with um, the Inquisition. What was the purpose of the Inquisition? It was to seek out error. So if, if someone was thought to be teaching error, it was important to bring them back to the faith, okay? Because you don't want them to be sinking deeper and deeper into ignorance and where they could be corrected of that ignorance and be brought to the truth. Move forward in time and we enter into the modern world and we find ourselves today in a very pluralistic society. And it's a very globalized society, given the wonders of technology. You can, you know, you can go to Far East Asia through your screen. So it's a very uh, a pluralistic world and we're very aware of the differences in the world today. But that does not preclude the truth of Jesus Christ as the one true savior. The conditions of our modern pluralistic world have given rise to an error and a sin and it is called the sin of indifferentism to say to be indifferent to the distinctions or the differences between religions and to say oh it's all the same all religions essentially teach you to be good and to avoid evil and to treat your neighbor uh, with justice right so it's all the same anyways no it's not at least not according to the catholic teaching okay the catholic church will maintain that indifferentism is wrong it's an error because there is a truth and there's a fullness of truth and God comes to offer us the fullness of life in the fullness of truth in the name of his son. Okay. And that's the, 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 the peak of God's revelation. And that's where salvation is to be found. So we cannot simply say, Oh, I'm Christian and you're not, but that's okay because we all uh, live the same anyways. No. Uh, if you believe in, Jesus Christ, there should be something different in you than the person who does not yet believe. Christ and the grace that he brings uh, is radically different and more. He died on the cross, he's resurrected from the dead, and that is unique in the Christian faith. But nonetheless, with the, the development of society, entering first into you know, this discovery of whole populations who have not known Therefore, we need to preach to them. And then into our modern world in which uh, there is great pluralism. Um, not only are there a multitude of Christian groups, there's a multitude of other religions that don't believe in, in Jesus Christ. And they're not all the same. They're not all equal. Okay. Uh, but given these circumstances, theology also continues to develop in its understanding. And so we have a more inclusive view being developed um, since the time of Vatican II. So inclusive as in contrast to exclusive. So the exclusive is I'm in, you're out. Okay, that kind of drawing the dividing line. Hmm? That's not the teaching of the church. Rather, the church wants to offer salvation to all. It is a more inclusive view, though it's not an absolute, you know, uh, free for all. Come one, come all, we're all the same. We're all saved, God loves you all. No, there are clear conditions to what it means to be saved. But this inclusive view uh, can be characterized in these three ways. And these are ideas that have developed in more recent time. So firstly, there is a focus on logoi spermatikoi or um, logos spermatikos. And if you recall, we get this from very early on, Justin Martyr, uh, employing the idea of logos spermatikos, the seeds of the word sperm, logos, okay? The, the seeds of the word are planted in all of creation in God's very act of creation. When God creates through his word, he, he gives the seed of his eternal word, his son, in all things. And so that becomes the fundamental ground, the hope for the birthing of the Christian faith in all persons. There's also something called baptism by desire. We've talked about the standard normative way of baptism, baptism using water in the form of, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's there are two other forms of baptism, which are rare, but possible. And they are what you have on the screen here, baptism by desire, and what's not on the screen, baptism by blood. So baptism by desire is also called baptism by fire. And it's not that you dunk someone into fire three times, 
but rather it's referring to the fires of desire. So if someone desires to be baptized, but is for some reason unable to actually get a real sacramental baptism, they are considered by the church as belonging to the communion of the uh, Christian Catholic tradition uh, by virtue of baptism of desire. So let's say I'm preparing for my baptism. It's Easter vigil. I'm excited. I've been preparing for a year or two. I'm on my way to my own baptism, real baptism with the church gathered. But before I get there, I get hit by a car and I'm dying. Okay, let's say if I actually die, then I would be considered a baptized Christian nonetheless because of my professed clear desire. I've been pursuing this for a year or two. And even though the actual ritual did not take place, by virtue of my desire, the church would consider me truly baptized. If, let's say, paramedics come and save me and I survive the accident, I don't actually die, then I would, of course, proceed to receive the normative you know, baptism by water. A third kind of baptism, and that is baptism by blood. And again, it's not in blood, but rather it's the act of shedding one's blood the act of martyrdom, dying for the Christian faith, even though one may not yet be um, baptized Christian. Okay, so if someone um, dies for Christ, the name of Christ, then um, that would be considered a baptism by blood. Now, uh, would that be the same for babies who die without being baptized? That would not be the same for babies. So let's say when um, a child dies in the womb, whether it be through abortion, a very violent act, or maybe miscarried, um, very sad, so a welcomed baby. Uh, and let's say maybe the parents even wanted to baptize the child, uh, but the child dies. The church has found this to be very difficult uh, to explain. So the church has no authority to say, uh, these persons are saved by, by what reasoning, by what rationale. If salvation comes in Jesus Christ alone, Every, and everyone is conceived with original sin. And these babies have not professed faith in Jesus and they have died in original sin because they have not received baptism. Then the church cannot simply say, oh, we say they are saved. On the other hand, the church has said that it's not in keeping with the, the image of God that we profess to believe in to say that God damns these innocent children. So what the church has has stated formally is it's it has identified limbo where do these babies go they go to limbo limbo isn't actually a place it's not like a second purgatory but rather limbo is the word for uncertain it's actually a theological position saying that we just don't know we can't explain this and the only way we can deal with this is to commend these babies to the mercy of god and understand that God is the one who saves. God is the one who grants salvation. He's the one who knows the truth of all reality. And we commend these babies to the mercy and grace of God. Now, very interestingly though, after the celebration of Christmas in the liturgical calendar, there is a celebration of um, some babies who died for Jesus. Okay, so if you recall in the story, of the nativity and then you had the three wise men whom Harold said you know seek out this new king that has been born and come back and tell me so I can worship him too but actually Herod is afraid for his throne so he wants to extinguish this new king that has been born the the three uh, wise men do not actually return to Herod Herod in rage um, still wants to protect himself so what does he do he kills all the infants of Israel all the male infants are, are slaughtered. And this is why Mary and Joseph with baby Jesus flee to Egypt. Okay. There's a real threat on Jesus's life. Okay. And so they flee to Egypt. Jesus is spared. But in Jerusalem, uh, in um, Nazareth, in Israel, all of these babies are killed. And the church honors these babies. They celebrate. There's a feast for the innocents. And it's referring to the innocent babies who died for Christ. Even though they hadn't reached an age of reason in which they choose to lay their lives down for Christ, but nonetheless, they were instrumental in the, the way the story of salvation played out. And so the church honors them. They're considered saints. And we have a day uh, in which we celebrate 
the witness that they gave. Okay, so it's that mystery of God's mercy that we cannot exhaust through our theologies. Um, on the point of um, baptism by desire, a few years ago, my cousin died of an aneurysm and um, my cousin on my mother's side. So my mother converted to Catholicism before she married my dad. She had 15 siblings. <laughs> and so um, I have quite a few relatives who are non-Catholic. They are mostly Buddhist and ancestral worshiping. So I've gone to temple quite a bit, uh, usually for funerals. Uh, my cousin, who was not Christian, he was actually a very good Buddhist. He would um, fast uh, for weeks on end, you know, with on bread and water. I mean, a more strict fast than what I do as a Catholic nun. But um, he was a very good Buddhist, 29 years of age at that time. And um, he had an aneurysm on Christmas Eve. So I get this message, and on Christmas Day, uh, I go to the hospital in downtown at the medical center to visit him. And the hospital is, you know, practically empty of um, doctors and nurses because it's Christmas Day. They allow us in to visit. It's clear that, you know, he's he's not going to survive this. He's they haven't pronounced him brain. They have him on machines, uh, so machines breathing for him. But um, eventually, uh, they're going to pull the plug, and his life is going to end but we have this time for the family to be with him so my sister my older sister who is also a dominican sister um, she and i go to visit him uh, there he is in the hospital his dad is with us also um, good practicing buddhist but as soon as his dad leaves the room my uncle leaves the room my sister kind of nudges me and she says hey baptize him and i said baptize him can I do that? And I started thinking in my mind, there is no evidence that he ever manifested any desire. If he had, in the course of, you know, our knowing each other um, as cousins, he said to me, hey, what's what's that Christianity thing that, you know, you've devoted your life to? And, and it sounds interesting. And I want to know more about Jesus, or I want to be a Christian, or I'm interested in this. Then there might be a doorway in which I would say, yes, I will baptize him, have him become part of the body of Christ and, and be saved. Um, but I couldn't think of any anything like that. I could only see how he was very a, a very devout Buddhist. So I could not go against his will. Him, he, that, that would be wrong to do. I must respect him and his life and his will. And he was a very good person, um, very religious, though not Christian. Okay. So again, um, I did not baptize him. It would not be a baptism by desire or by blood or clearly not by water, right? But rather we commend these certain circumstances to the mercy of God, okay? There's thirdly, what we have here is Karl Rahner's anonymous Christian. So Karl Rahner is the Jesuit theologian that I introduced you to last class. He's the one who gave us, along with Schilebex, the Dominican, gave us this idea of Christ is the primordial sacrament of God. He also has something to say about Christianity and then and salvation in the name of Jesus. He will say that there are anonymous Christians. There are human beings out there who are not overtly professed Christians, though they are anonymous Christians without even knowing it. They are living according to the grace and the mercy and the virtues that we have in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we can consider the possibility of their salvation in the name of Jesus, too. Okay? So this was a controversial um, proposal that emerged at the time of Vatican II. Uh, so it's still a theological proposition that's considered. We are now reading from Lumen Gentium, then. And uh, you've seen the name Lumen Gentium before. It is the document from the Second Vatican Council on the church. So it's the dogmatic constitution on the church. This is where the Vatican Council looks to explain the identity of herself. Who is the church? And this is what we find in Lumen Gentium paragraph number eight. It says, Christ, the one mediator, established and continually sustains here on earth his holy church. Okay, so again, Christ is always core and center. He alone is the mediator of salvation. He alone is savior. What does he do? He establishes the church and he sustains it, a very real church that is visible here on earth. 
And this church is a community of faith, hope, and charity. Okay, those virtues, those powers of your soul, which the spirit activates within us through baptism. Okay, that's what the church is. It's the community of those who have faith, hope, and charity. And this community of faith is an entity with visible delineation. So it is an institution here on earth. It has visible delineation through which he communicated truth, communicated truth and grace to all. So again, we have this sacramental structure, a visible delineation. That's the visible sign of a sacrament that points to something that's invisible. It's the truth and grace that Christ communicates. Okay? So it's very sacramental. But you can't do away with the visible sign and, and still have a claim to the invisible reality. The sacramental structure um, modeled after the incarnation is always about the visible gift that points to uh, the invisible grace. Society structured with hierarchical organs, okay, the hierarchy, the pope, the bishops, the, the priests, uh, the lay and the religious, that's the hierarchical, well, the hierarchy refers to the clergy, they're ordained, but that's very visible. Okay? So this society, which is very visible, is also a mystical body that's invisible, right? So these always, always go together, visible, invisible. These are not to be considered as two realities. They're not separate realities. Nor are the visible assembly, again visible, and the spiritual community, invisible. Nor the earthly church, visible, and the church enriched with heavenly things, invisible. Rather, they form one complex reality. Okay, so the visible and invisible, they form one complex reality, which coalesces from a divine and a human element. So it coalesces, the divine and the human, the visible and invisible, it coalesces. Coalesce is, uses the image like two rivers coalescing, two rivers that merge. The visible and invisible come together as one. That's the church. It must have a visible reality that points to something invisible of truth and grace. For this reason, by no weak analogy, it is compared to the mystery of the incarnate word. The incarnation is that very reality of the unity of God and man. And by analogy, the church too is this coalescence of divine and human elements. As the assumed nature inseparably united to him in the incarnation serves the divine word, okay, the human nature is visible, the divine word is invisible, so too in a similar way does the visible social structure of the church, the visible church here on earth, it serves the spirit of Christ, the invisible, which vivifies, gives life, and builds up the body. That's this understanding of what is the church. It's this coalescence of divine and human elements. Now, this is the most important statement, perhaps maybe even of all of the entire Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council. This is this, the church that's being described just now. This is the one church of Christ. Now, notice one church of Christ. Today, if you look out into the world, there are a multitude of Christian churches. But Christ, he only established one, okay? So it's saying that this, what is being described up here, is the one church that Christ established. That same church, which in the creed is professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic. So remember the ancient creed, Nicaea 325, and earlier the Apostles' Creed, by which the apostles were baptizing, it professes faith in the church as one holy Catholic and apostolic. This is the DNA test for the original church of Christ. So uh, this is the one church of Christ professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, which our savior after his resurrection commissioned Peter to shepherd. Okay, this is that same church mentioned in Matthew 16, 16, the church established on Peter and him and the other apostles tend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages. Remember, this church is to last to the end of time as the pillar and mainstay of this truth. Now, this church, the Church of Christ, one holy Catholic apostolic, constituted and organized in the world as a society, okay, visible dimension, it subsists in the Catholic Church. Okay, that's the radical statement. Okay, everything that's been described up here as the church which Christ founded, the church which we profess as one holy Catholic apostolic, the church that Jesus commissioned to, to shepherd, that church, it subsists in the Catholic Church. 
And it, there, and next it clarifies which Catholic church are we talking about? The one which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. In other words, it's the Roman Catholic church because that's the church that is governed by the successor of Peter today. Note the word subsists. The council is very, very careful. It does not say the one church of Christ, one holy Catholic apostolic, the original authentic church founded by Christ. It does not use the word is. It does not equate the one church of Christ is the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't say that. But it does not say it is not. Rather, it takes this very careful articulation. It says that one church of Christ, it subsists. What does subsist mean? It means to exist of its own accord. Okay, exist in its total reality. That one church of Christ it subsists in the Catholic Church. If it's governed by the successor of Peter, then we can say subsists in the Roman Catholic Church. So it is, it's sounding exclusive here, right? But it's actually not. It's this very careful articulation wants to be inclusive without um, losing what is unique about the Roman Catholic Church. Because if we continue reading, what do we find? So indeed, the one Catholic Church of Christ I'm sorry, the one church of Christ does subsist in the Catholic Church. It exists in its total reality, where in the Catholic Church. But listen on. Although many elements of sanctification in truth are found outside of its visible structure. So if you have in the center this Roman Catholic Church, in which the one church of Christ subsists in its total reality, this Roman Catholic Church does not exhaust the total reality of the one church of Christ, such that you can still find elements of sanctification, true holiness, and elements of truth, okay, truth and holiness, found outside of the visible structures of this one Roman Catholic Church. But note the articulation, there are only elements. Okay, it's not the full reality. The full reality has been established by Jesus Christ in the one church. And it is found in specifically the church that has that meets all of the requirements that that has the DNA test to verify it as one holy Catholic and apostolic elements of truth and sanctification or sanctification and truth can truly exist in all other Christian denominations in varying degrees. What determines the varying degrees, the degrees to which they manifest oneness, holiness. Catholicity as in universality, and apostolic. Probably apostolic is the clearest criteria that differentiates between the different Christian groups. Because what does apostolic mean? It means that this one church of Christ was founded on the 12 apostles. The apostles are the foundations of the church. And how did the, the apostles extend the authority that was given to them, invested in them in Jesus Christ? Well, the, the, those 12 apostles laid their hands upon their successors, and these were the bishops that they ordained. Okay? And those bishops laid their hands to the next generation, carrying on the message directly from Jesus, who gave his message to, to the apostles and commissioned them to go to the ends of the earth. The church that is truly apostolic should be able to trace herself back through her leader, Okay, through the leader of the church, directly from the present leader, all the way back to the original 12 apostles. The Roman Catholic Church can do this. Today, the successor of Peter is Pope Francis. And Pope, prior to Pope Francis, Pope Francis succeeded Pope Benedict. Benedict succeeded Pope John Paul II. And we actually do have a list of 265 popes. And an unbroken lineage can trace themselves back directly to Peter, the head of the apostles, okay? So this is why uh, the Roman Catholic Church possesses the oneness, holiness, Catholicity, and apostolicity in a very uh, robust way. The Orthodox Church can also claim apostolicity. Why? Because through the apostle Andrew, who evangelized in the East. And so when the Orthodox and the Catholic Church broke off from one another, the, the breaking off happened between the bishops. So they are still legitimate bishops and they still continue to hand on apostolicity. Versus if I am um, a preacher today of a congregation, let's say I went to seminary school, learned my theology and I'm on fire and I preach the word of God in a powerful way. 
I start my own church. Well, I can do that and I can preach powerfully and I can have a congregation, but it's not an apostolic congregation because there's no direct lineage. So if we maintain what is what we find in the original early, early church before there were any divisions, then there is a profession of faith in the church as one holy Catholic and apostolic. And I, I'm developing here the notion of apostolicity because it's kind of it has a clearest delineation. Mind you, the fullness of the means to salvation are, are given in this church in which the one church of Christ subsists. So the fullness of the means are here. There is a difference between the fullness of the one church of Christ and the elements of sanctification. Okay, But at the same time, the council is not being audacious in saying we are, the Roman Catholic Church is. It does not use the word is. It specifically chooses, and there's a lot of debate that leads to this final articulation, and it chooses the word subsist to convey that the full reality is still given in total in this original Catholic Church, which existed from the beginning of the time of the church after Christ as one holy Catholic apostolic. Where do you find that church today? Well, you would have to go through the litmus test of one holy Catholic apostolic for all of the different churches. The possibilities for salvation in the, in the church are more robust, though the possibility of salvation outside the church is still real. Okay. Now, does being in the Roman Catholic Church guarantee your salvation? Absolutely not. You can still sin gravely and find uh, Roman Catholics in hell damned because they, they have been given perhaps the fullness and yet not appreciated, not actually utilized the fullness of the graces that they have been given. And this is what will play out in Numbers 14, 15, and 16. The fullness of the means of salvation. If you want to go, well, no one's going anywhere these days, but if you want to go to the Bahamas um, this summer, it's like saying, here's the full package, round trip ticket, hotel, room and board, or I mean, the full package versus, you know, here's a ticket, not the full resort package, right? So salvation can still be had because elements are available for you to work out that salvation, but it's not the fullness. So the these elements or the fullness are offered in different degrees, either within the church or outside the church. And then whether or not one is saved will depend on how they receive what is offered. So there's no guarantee of salvation for anyone until you live according to what it means to be saved in the name of Jesus.